and you're up there. Hi, um, sorry, thanks for the introduction, Gary. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Erin Burke. I'm the protected species biologist for the Division of Marine Fisheries. I've been with the agency since 2005 and manage our large whale and sea turtle conservation programs, among other things. And today I'm gonna to be giving you an update about all of the many things that have been going on with right whales in the last few years. Um, it's a lot, and so I hope I've covered everything, but if you have any questions along the way, um, feel free to speak up. Oh shoot, should I move this, Gary? It's kind of in people's way. What's that? Um, <clears throat> nothing, sorry. Okay. So um, the North Atlantic right whale has been in decline since about 2010. Um, much of the um, good population growth that we had over the last few decades has been wiped out um, in this decline. And as of the start of 2020, there were only around 336 individual right whales left in the population. This decline starting in 2010 has coincided with an oceanographic regime shift, which affected the distribution of right whales prey, Calamus copepods, um, and thus has affected their seasonal distribution as well, moving them into uh, more northern and offshore habitats where protections um, might not be in place for them or where entanglements, if they occur, um, will be more severe. So in, in conjunction with this distribution change and this increased mortality, um, the National Marine Fisheries Service uh, designated an unusual mortality event for right whales starting in 2017 um, to the present uh, to account for all these mortalities. And um, in that time, there's been 34 known right, more, right whale mortalities. And um, entanglement and vessel collision are still the, the main um, human-induced causes of serious injury and mortality throughout their range. In the last couple of years, Massachusetts has been dealing with a number of conservation challenges relative to right whales, uh, one of which are the most recent amendments to the take reduction plan to you know, deal with ongoing entanglement issues um, and the decline of the right whale. Um, the goal that we were meeting back in 2020 was for a 60% risk reduction target, um, and that included expanding closures, implementing a uh, weak rope um, on some scale and having um, expanded gear marking. Uh, the feds published this summer that final rule with implementation for May 1st of 2022. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later about um, some of the things that are in that plan. Uh, concurrent with that is a litigation that was filed against the Commonwealth um, citizen suit provision um, by Max Strahan that alleges uh, violations of the ESA by the lobster fishery for takes of leatherback sea turtles and right whales um, in our buoy lines. And uh, the judge uh, ruled that we needed to apply for an incidental take permit under section 10 of the Endangered Species Act in order to authorize the fishery. Um, a main component of an ITP is a habitat conservation plan, which describes the permitted activity, um, the endangered species populations that are in your waters, um, the you know, potential and anticipated takes, and also describes ways to minimize those takes and to, to monitor, um, monitor takes as well. Um, so that is a you know, huge component of the ITP. In order to... Um, address these continuing concerns with right whales, DMF went to rulemaking um, in 2020 to implement additional protected species regulations. The purpose of these regulations is to um, minimize the potential for right whales to encounter fixed gear in state waters. And if they do encounter the gear, um, to minimize the, the injury that might be caused by that gear in, in the event that, that they do um, encounter it. Oops, sorry. So we did that through a couple of measures, um, seasonal gear, gear closures and gear modifications. Um, 
the cornerstone and the gear closures was an expansion of the Massachusetts Bay restricted area up to the New Hampshire border um, and an extension of that closure until May 15th. Um, so that the hatched area is the original um, federal Massachusetts Bay restricted area, which um, was implemented in 2015. And the, the pink area you can see are the portions of state waters um, that are closed. Now the, the federal closure only goes, that hatched area only goes through April 30th, but our closure goes through May 15th. Um, in addition, we extended um, the seasonal gillnet closure to um, include all the waters of Cape Cod, um, Cape Cod Bay. But we recently realized that that was um, not protective enough. And so last week we went to public hearing proposing to have a gillnet closure from January 1st to May 15th in all Massachusetts state waters. So that red area is kind of outdated there. We also implemented a seasonal recreational lobster trap pot closure in all state waters from November 1st to May 15th. So the reasoning behind ex expanding the closure is in response to an extension of right whale seasonal distribution um, since the implementation of the original closure. Um, even though, why is that doing that? <laughs> even though right whales um, have been on the decline, the, the proportion of the population that visits Massachusetts waters really hasn't changed um, in that time. We still see you know, around 60%, you know, some years it's 50, some years it's 65, um, 60, you know, 5% of the population visits our waters in late winter and early spring. Um, right whales have been shifting their distribution during that time, specifically in March and April, um, and some in May outside of Cape Cod Bay, which had been the traditional area where they aggregated. And we've had more sightings in Massachusetts Bay and on the North Shore. In addition, right whales have been staying later. Um, it used to be by April 30th, they all just like left, you know, it seems like en masse um, in some years, but we've had them staying until mid-May, um, over the last few years, and that has been kind of consistent. So the extension of closure is to try to, you know, is a response to that change in the season of distribution and to expand protections for right whales to those areas. Another important component of the protected species regulations that we've implemented are the buoy line modifications. Um, chief among those is the requirement for all buoy lines to break under um, no more than 1,700 pounds of, of tension. Um, now this threshold is based on um, a study that New England Aquarium did of entangling gear that was taken off of right whales and, and relating that to the severity of the injury of the animal. They found that um, you know, 1,700 pounds or less you know, greatly reduced the amount of injury that the animals experienced. So this can be accomplished in a few different ways. You can either use fully formed weak rope um, throughout your buoy line, or you can have weak inserts or contrivances every 60 feet in the upper 75% of line. And that um, was deemed by the feds to also be considered um, a fully formed weak rope, you know, throughout the length of the, of the buoy line. We also required um, a cap on buoy line diameter um, for recreational and commercial trap pot gear, uh, 3 eighths inch for commercial and 5 sixteenths for the recreational trap pot gear. Um, this is to you know, prevent anybody from using heavier, um, you know, higher breaking strength line, but also sort of serves as a de facto gear marking that, you know, if, um, three quarter inch line gets pulled off a right whale, we can say definitively that it did not come from Massachusetts state waters because you're not allowed to fish anything larger than three eighths inch. So, um, you know, the change over to weak rope is a, is a huge change. And in order to get that off the ground, we received funds from the governor and a grant from Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission to um, hire someone to help us um, implement it and also to buy some equipment. So we hired Justin Wilson, who's our gear specialist, um, to help us get this uh, new regulation off the ground. So there were, are a few different options if you want to use weak rope. There are two different Rocky Mount um, fully formed cordages that break at 1,700 pounds. They're both um, 3 eighths inch 
There are a few other companies that are sort of working on um, on other on other similar ropes, but these are the ones that are sort of widely available. Uh, the other option is to use weak insertions or contrivances um, within the line. Um, so you kind of insert weak points and that can be done either with a Nova braid sleeve or with weak rope. Um, prior to prior to this uh, this being implemented, the South Shore sleeve, um, this one here, it's also made by Nova Braid, was the only one that was sort of known and widely available. Uh, this was developed by South Shore Lobstermen's Group um, and has been fished um, by a number of fishermen successfully uh, for a few years now leading up to the implementation of weak rope. But we wanted to make sure the fishermen had other options as well. So we worked with um, commercial fishermen, MLA, state of Maine, nymphs um, to test other options um, for you know, kind of splicing in the the weak rope um, and using that as um, as a weak insert. Um, you know, it's another option to the sleeve. So we submitted um, ten samples of of each of the contrivances, and many of them performed really well and were approved by nymphs. Um, the goal was for uh, these contrivances to be. Um, you know, recognizable, repeatable, and enforceable um, so that you, you know, some fishermen have wanted, have said, hey, why can't we use knots? Um, because, you know, a knot reduces the strength of the line by 40% or something, but um, it's hard to, um, you know, have consistency there. So we're looking for other options, ways to splice things in. Um, so we have a number of options um, that are available to fishermen. To, to help get this off the ground, um, Justin did a really good job of doing, in addition to other DMF staff, helped a lot. Um, we went basically out on the road and brought um, two coils to each fisherman that wanted them and 20 sleeves. Um, so the, the weak rope was rule was approved in January of 2021, and it was going to be implemented come May. So we had a short amount of time to... Um, get material out to the industry, get the information to them and have them re-rig their line in time for the season to open. So from March to May of 2021, we did 14 different outreach events across the state um, and deliver materials to over 600 um, commercial fishermen. We still have um, a lot of coils of rope left, um, which I'll talk about a little bit later. We're gonna try to get that out to people um, in the next month or so. But, you know, weak rope as a concept, um, you know, has come a long way. Like it started as, as a concept based on examining and tangling gear. Um, then it moved to, you know, testing the weak sleeves and also putting um, tensometers online to see what sort of tension their, you know, loads they're operating under. Um, then we moved to, you know, testing in a laboratory. And now we have all of our fishermen fishing in the this on their buoy lines in real time in the ocean. Um, so it's a huge change over a short period of time. And, um, but our fishermen have been really patient um, and proactive about this. Um, and this is also a, you know, a big component of our ITP regulations. So the week rope was implemented in May um, of last year. And then in August, we had a documented entanglement where the um, weak insertion was sort of activated. A humpback whale calf encountered a buoy line off of Rockport um, and was observed by a whale watch boat. Uh, the animal traveled under the boat. Um, and we think it was the, um, the um, you know, interacting with the bottom of the boat, that force on the line caused it to part, um, but it did um, part at the contrivance and it released the whale and the gear was collected. Uh, so to just kind of verify that that the, the gear functioned as it was supposed to, uh, Justin and we, part, we partnered with um, NIMS to do like a little case study of this and Rob Martin from NIMS rigged up um, this contrivance, which was an approved contrivance, rigged up a number of samples to test on the machine, and then also rigged up the same contrivance, but using standard strength rope, so no weak rope. Um, and 
both sets of samples, um, you know, the control and then the weak rope, they both behaved in the same way. They both um, parted at the contrivance, but obviously the breaking strength was much lower, um, you know, was around 1500 pounds with the weak line and with the standard strength rope, it was around 3200, which is what you would expect for, um, you know, traditional strength uh, three eighths line. Around the same time um, in September, the feds released their phase one final rule. Um, and many of the things that they implemented are similar to what we had put into place, but our rules are more um, restrictive. Uh, this is in part because um, we need to be able to, to have a successful ITP. We need to be able to distinguish the gear that's fished in Massachusetts state waters from other jurisdictions. So in the federal rule for the Northeast lobster and crab fishery, they had new trap pot closure areas, including this large closure um, south of the islands from February through April. Um, in addition, they had weak rope requirements, um, though theirs weren't as frequent um, you know, throughout the line as ours were. Um, they had expanded gear marking, but again, um, the gear marking that we're doing is, um, is more frequently throughout the line and is stricter um, than what the feds have proposed for their jurisdictions. Um, they also changed the closure definition to um, have the, the area be closed only to persistent buoy lines to allow ropeless fishing to occur in those areas. Um, if people have the, the right permit. So we're supposed to be in sort of phase two of, of these amendments where we're looking at gillnet and, and other trap pot fisheries, um, but we're sort of in a holding pattern with that right now because I think that the feds have realized that they weren't really able to get the risk reduction um, that they wanted from phase one um, out of federal waters and some other jurisdictions. Um, not Massachusetts though, the um, decision support tool that the feds have been using to, to analyze um, you know, conservation measures. When you look at all the changes that we've done in state waters, um, they found that we had a 92% risk reduction um, based on the extended closure and the weak rope um, in state waters that we reduced risk by 92%, which is, much higher than the 60% that they were looking for. And it's also higher than the 87% that the feds were hoping for um, by 2030. Um, so we're, we're ahead of the curve and all of the, the work that we've done over the last few years um, is worth it and is gonna make a huge difference in our ITP application as well. So um, to get back to the, we also implemented new trap gear buoy line marking requirements. Um, you can see on the left there what the feds had proposed for Massachusetts um, and then what we had proposed. Uh, we have more frequent marks throughout the line, one solid for state waters, one solid red foot mark in the first 12 feet of the buoy line, and then two two foot marks in the upper half and then the lower half. And, um, you know, obviously a lot of permit holders are dual permit holders and move their gear from state waters to federal waters. But the way that the, um, you know, ITP and, and jurisdiction over takes it works, we really need to be able to distinguish gear in state waters from that in even just nearby federal waters over the line. So if fishermen wanna move their gear from state waters into adjacent federal waters, they have to add a one foot solid green mark um, next to their red marks. And they also have um, one fewer red mark than we do in state waters. We're, we're really trying to make sure that like, there's no way for um, gear that was not fished in state waters to be identified as such. We really need to distinguish the gear that is set in state waters. So this is going to be implemented February 1st, so coming up in a couple of weeks. So just to give you an overview of where we're at with some of these other processes, um, we developed an ITP task force. Um, the, to get an ITP is a very lengthy process, um, requires a lot of work. 
uh, we received funding from the governor's office to hire two staff members to help us uh, deal with this workload, uh, Taylor Stoney and Scott Schaefer. There's, um, you know, there's a lot about the permitted fishery that has to be described. You have to analyze your protected species populations, um, look at the entanglement data, you know, all of the fisheries data, and it's a lengthy kind of iterative process back and forth with the feds trying to craft something that um, is going to work for NIPS. Um, so we are deep in the process of doing that, um, developing the habitat conservation plan that, you know, is going to assess all that and then describe our mitigation and minimization strategies for those takes and, and how we're going to monitor things. Um, another key component of this is the list of fisheries categorization under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, in order for our state waters trap pot fishery to get um, an ITP, we need to um, have our regulations be separate and distinct um, from the fisheries around us. And, you know, until recently, we had been lumped in with the Northeast um, lobster fishery because, you know, we all have generally the same regulations. Um, but to get the ITP, we have to be distinct enough. And if you're distinct enough, you get a separate categorization under the list of fisheries. Um, right now, the Northeast lobster fishery is a category one, meaning that they frequently encounter marine mammals. Um, and we were looking to get ourselves to a category two, which means you only occasionally um, encounter marine mammals. So based on all of the regulation changes that we did, um, the feds proposed um, in 2021 to list the Massachusetts um, trap pot fishery separately um, as its own category two fishery. Um, so that is very good news because really without that change, it would be impossible to get um, an incidental take permit um, from the feds. So we're still waiting on the um, sort of finalization of that. It should be any day, um, but that was very good news. Some of you may have heard, we're also conducting a, a ropeless fishing scoping project. We received a grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to develop a framework for ropeless fishing in New England. And we contracted Noah Oppenheim from Hamar Strategies to help us get that off the ground. Um, you know, we're looking to describe, you know, all the host of challenges that ropeless implementation faces, technological, operational, legal, regulatory, and the economic barriers, and sort of develop a, a suite of recommendations that might be used by NIMFs to um, put out RFPs for people to try to overcome some of those hurdles. So uh, NOAA conducted 60 interviews with a variety of stakeholders um, in the last year. And we also held an in-person workshop in October of 2021. NOAA is developing the final report and the recommendations for that. And that'll be ready in March of 2022. Uh, this fall, NIFWIF um, indicated that they were interested in us um, conducting an economic analysis, which we had initially put into our proposal, but they, um, I don't know if they just didn't have the funds at the time, but they came back to us and said, hey, could you guys actually do that economic analysis? So we um, recently had the grant get extended to um, for NOAA to work um, with the scientists at UMass um, on that. So some of you may also have heard we had um, we went to trial in June in the Strahan litigation. He had filed for a temporary restraining order to stop us from licensing buoy lines. Um, while we got our ITP. Um, the judge ruled in November in our favor, um, essentially dismissing the case um, for lack of standing on Strahan's part, but still she instructed DMF to continue to pursue an ITP, which, um, you know, even if she hadn't mentioned that, um, that is, that's what we would have continued to do. You know, we need to, um, um, protect ourselves and have this fishery be authorized and on the up and up and, you know, not have to worry about this. So uh, Taylor and uh, Bob and I and the rest of the ITP task force put together an outline and are working on chapters and we will be completing a draft of the application by June of 2022. 
As I mentioned, we're also awaiting the final list of fisheries designation, um, which should come any day now, which is going to sort of confirm for us that, all right, Massachusetts mixed species trap pot fishery is its own thing. We also have the implementation of the new gear marking regulations coming up, and we're working on a, an outreach, um, you know, kind of roadshow for that. We're going to purchase some gear marking materials to hand out to fishermen, and we also have a lot of weak rope that um, we're going to distribute as well. In addition, we're going to be doing some derelict gear removal in the closed area. You know, those closed areas have a lot of gear in them during the open season. And you know, certain amount of it is abandoned, lost, um, things like that. And so this year we're contracting with five fishermen to um, try to remove everything that's left. And we're also looking at some statute changes to streamline future gear removal um, that might smooth over some of the legal hurdles with ownership um, and making it like easier logistically for you know, fishermen to go out and, and clean up gear. So that is coming up as well. And that's kind of all I have for right now. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, if you have any questions, either put it in the chat or unmute yourself and ask Aaron. Uh, 